Let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that in your kingdom there are no accidents, no coincidences, that we're all here right now by your divine appointment. And Father, we would seek that your purpose would be accomplished in this time together, not only as a group, but also in our individual lives. We pray that you'd open your word to our hearts and lives, and we just pray, Father, that it would be fruitful for your kingdom as we commit ourselves, not just this evening, but in our lives, without reservation, into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we're in session 12 in our review of the book of Daniel, a very, very strange chapter in front of us, chapter 10. Chapter 10, I call it a glimpse of the dark side. We're going to get a peek into that strange, invisible world that we talk about with spiritual warfare. We often use that term idiomatically in broad terms, in terms of things of doctrine and other ways, but there's also, it's, 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 it's strange for us to actually realize there is a war going on that we don't see but is behind everything else going on. And we have allusions to that from place to place, but tonight we're going to actually get a, one of the rare glimpses into that in chapter 10. In fact, it's a prelude to the next two chapters, the final two chapters in the book of Daniel. So we're in chapter 10 tonight. Now just to stand back a little bit and get ourselves oriented, Daniel is in 12 chapters. The first six are historical. And where he's deported, encounters Nebuchadnezzar who has a dream which he interprets, which uh, prom you know, promotes him to a very high office. His rivals contrive a trap against his three friends. In chapter 3, the famous fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar gets a, letter, a lesson in pride. He writes one of the chapters in the Bible. Nebuchadnezzar wrote chapter 4. It's his testimony. Very interesting chapter. I personally believe when I get to heaven, I'll meet Nebuchadnezzar there. That's just a conjecture I have from what I infer from that chapter. But anyway, moving on. We have then the fall of Babylon. We spent some time on that because the Babylon, we believe, has a destiny and prophecy. And so we spent some, we did a double session on that. And then, of course, uh, we get to the Persian Empire. And the Persian Empire, we have the lion's den incident pr precipitated by the Magi, these, these, uh, this hereditary priesthood that uh, uh, was chafing under the fact that Darius put Daniel, a Jew, in charge of it. And, and that also has Christmas overtones in terms of some of the background of the New Testament. But that, those six chapters are in, uh, in uh, 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 our, our narrative, if you will. Chapter 7 to, uh, through 12, the next six chapters are visions. The, uh, from 2 to 7, chapters 2 through 7 are in Aramaic because it focuses on Gentile history. And uh, the, the chapters 7 through 12 are prophecies, visions. And uh, we've obviously in chapter 10. But another way to realize this, one thing I like to keep in front of you is they're not in chronological order. Chapter 7 comes between, chapter 7 and 8 both fall between chapters 4 and 5. Their visions appended at the end, but they really occur um, in, uh, uh, in, in, before the fall of Babylon. And then we have uh, the 70 weeks, which we had last time. Now we have the dark side of the supernatural world, and then we're heading to the final tr uh, trick. And we are in that section now, the final section, which is again in Hebrew. Chapters 8 through 12 are again in Hebrew, because the focus of the book is, of course, uh, uh, of this part of the book is on Israel. Daniel, Daniel's people. The other, the previous chapters two through seven are particularly interesting to scholars and to us personally because it's focusing on the Gentiles. But chapters eight through 12 is, a, 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 and of course we're in chapter 10. And, but before we do that, before we jump, t chapter 10 is a nice little short chapter. We'll have no trouble covering it. Before we get into it, I want to retrace some steps and take a look at another glimpse that we get, even a little briefer glimpse, in 2 Kings chapter 6. And uh, this is just a fun little episode that I thought would be a good preamble to jumping into chapter 10. We're in 2 Kings 6, starting at verse 8. And of course, there's a tension between Syria and Israel, just as there is today, actually. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with a servant, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. Get the picture. The Syrians are planning to be in a certain place of camp. The man of God, that's referring to Elisha at this point, 
Remember, there's two major prophets that show up in this era. One is Elijah, right? We all know about Elijah because of Mark Carmel and so forth. And this young guy that was uh, uh, tagging around behind him, Elisha, that he tried to shake for a while. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, as you know, that, and, and Elisha had the audacity, I think the proper technical term is chutzpah, <laughs> to uh, the books, are, there are books full of, uh, Hebrew books full of trying to define chutzpah. It doesn't have an equivalent in other languages. Uh, one example of chutzpah is a person who murders his mother and father then throws himself to the mercy of the court because he's an orphan. That takes chutzpah, <laughs> see. So, and there's, there's dozens of these silly little stories that try to, basically it's audacity uh, uh, with the decimal point moved over. Um, but in any case, um, the uh, Elijah, Elisha wanted a double portion. You know, Elijah was this fantastic character with all these wild episodes in fact, there's eight of them, eight major miracles by Elijah. Elisha wanted to not only to get his mantle, which he ended up getting, but he wanted a double portion. And it's kind of interesting because when you study the, history, the career of Elisha, you discover there's 16 miracles, not eight. So that's kind of fun. But we're dealing here with Elisha. And uh, so the Syria would set its camp somewhere. And the man of God here in verse, two, uh, in verse 9 is uh, Elisha, sent to the king of Israel, the enemies of Syria, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. This is not a single incident. This happened again and again and again. So much so that the king of Israel is ups that, that, uh, and the king of Israel set to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself there not once or twice. I love the King James. You can't improve on that. In other words, not just a single time, again and again, not once or twice. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was more was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? In other words, Israel is tipped off so often, so accurately, the king of Syria assumes there's a spy in his council. He's got a spy in the top, in, among his staff somehow. He says, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? He's really upset about that. And uh, one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king. But Elisha the prophet that is in Israel telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. This is the first recorded instance of a wiretap. <laughs> so in other words, they figured out, somehow they know, that the king of Israel is being tipped off by the prophet Elisha, who keeps him posted on where the king of Syria is planning to make his moves. So the king of Syria has got an answer to this. He said... Go and spy where he is, that is Elisha, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city round about. So this is called the setup. You got the picture. Elisha and his servant are in Dothan. The Syrian army has surrounded this they call it a city. It's more like what well, you and I would call a village. But anyway, you get the picture. Now, early in the morning, get the, I want you to get the picture. The servant of Elijah gets up. When the, servant, when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And the servant said unto him, to Elijah, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Get the picture. He gets up early, as apparently was his custom. He looks outside their encampment and he sees the place is surrounded by the army of their enemy. The servants in panic. Alas, is sort of a, you know, a, a, a faint exclamation. We get the picture, though. My master, what shall we, you know, how shall we do? And then you get Elisha's rather canned response. Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. I'm just guessing, but I imagine the servant thought, that sounds like a cliche to me, you know. And there's an expression, if you've been in the Navy or the Marine Corps, I think it's in the Army too, there's always the expression among the cynics in the foxholes, there's the always 2% that don't get the word, you know. And uh, I, I, I sort of feel that's probably the way the servant, feeling that somehow my master doesn't understand, you know. I can hear their engines 
running out there. I can hear the, you know, he, he, he uh, uh, knows that he's, he's panicked. And so Elisha prayed. He recognized his servant was in panic here. Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. I, I, I can't help but visualize Elisha doing this sort of, with a certain amount of exasperation, that this servant is so panicked, there's no reason to. Lord, show him, will you? And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around Elisha. In other words, the servant's looking as we would see it, humanly. He sees at, on the horizon the enemy forces, and he's panicked. They're surrounded. Just a couple of them, what are they going to do? And Elisha's not panicked at all. And he, to, for, in deference, Lord, show him. And suddenly his eyes open, and he realizes between them and the enemy, they're surrounded by chariots of fire. And, uh, you know, this is... this. Uh, Reminds me of something. How many of you use a computer, a word processor? Can I see a show of hands? Quite a few of you do, right? You, you, have a, you sit there with the word processor, and you can type. And modern word processors allow you to do a lot of different things. You can pick the font, whether it's bold or not, or italic or underline. There's all these things you can do if you want to. But those options, you don't want to get in your way, okay? And so you, when, you, when you're writing whatever you're writing, you just want to see what you're writing. But there are occasions... And behind the scenes that you don't want to see, you don't want to be bothered with, there are also codes, uh, obviously whether it's capital or case, but also whether it should be underlined or italic or, brown or what type font it should be in, should it be in black and some color. There's dozens of codes that could be being inserted there you don't want to be bothered with normally. But there are occasions when, in order to unsort something special you're doing, you want to see the codes that lie behind the text. And most advanced word processors have a, real, a, real, a revealed codes key. If you push that key, then suddenly you see all this other stuff that's going on to support what you're trying to say. If it's an outline, there's all kinds of things it's doing for you that are automatic. And you may want to interfere with that sometimes. The, the point is, is there's two ways to look at your document, normally, or with a revealed codes key. See, that's one of our problems in life. So this, this uh, uh, that uh, Elisha's servant wanted the revealed codes key. You know, give me a peek at what's really going on, see? We're sitting here, and, and on the one hand, we know there's spiritual warfare going on, and in some of our lives, very tangibly, it may be occurring. Certainly in ministries, it does. It's always a warfare in many ways. And, uh, but, uh, and, and we resort to the comfort of the Scripture for our confidence that it's going to be taken care of, but it's also a, a form of trust. And... Uh, I was on a, I was on a call-in program just recently where someone had a very troubled situation. And one of the things I tried to point out to them, the Lord finds a different way in each of our lives every day to ask the question, do you trust me? That seems to be part of the running issue in your relationship with him. Do you trust him? And, and he finds many different ways to raise that question. In any case, uh, this, this narrative finishes. I'll give you a little more. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, uh, and, and said uh, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man you, whom you seek. But he led them, rather, to Samaria. It came to pass when they were coming to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. The king of Israel said unto Elisha, when he saw them, My father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? And uh, he answered, said, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldst thou smite those that thou hast taken captive with thy, with thy sword and with thy bow? Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And he prepared, uh, prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and uh, they went to their master. But here's the key sentence. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. So <laughs> enough's enough, right? Okay, enough of this. Just a glimpse, a little incident back in 2 Kings. Let's jump where we should be in Daniel chapter 10, uh, a glimpse in the dark side. 10 verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel whose name was called Belteshazzar, 
And the thing was true, and the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. This is an introductory paragraph to this vision. Bear in mind that this chapter 10 has been appended to the, the historical narrative. And this, uh, in Daniel chapter 1, we know that Daniel's career extended to the first, to the first year of Cyrus. This vision, for those of you that are watching closely, is in the third year of Cyrus. So Daniel was this, he was, this is his third year out of public life. His public life went up through the first year of Cyrus. This is in the third year. So Cyrus, so he's in retirement here. That's basically the, the, uh, the, uh, um, the situation. It's a very analogous situation to John on the island of Patmos, who was in a sense in exile or in, ret in a retirement in a non non-professional mode of some kind. And uh, so uh, there's, and one of the people wondered, gee, well, you know, it, in the first year of Cyrus, he made the decree for them to go back to their home and start rebuilding the temple. Why, what's Daniel doing still here in Persia? And the, it, it's just speculation, we don't know. We suspect that he didn't join the others going back because of his age. He was probably in his 80s. And so he just stayed put. That's the, that's the, the, uh, that, that's our, the presumption of most scholars. Because this is near the, the, it's the very end of his life. In fact, this is this chapter ten is a prelude to the final vision that wraps up the book. And uh, anyway, in those days, I Daniel was mourning three full weeks. And incidentally, the Hebrew says weeks of days. Interestingly enough, it doesn't depend on you on, not to confuse you with the weeks of years that we had in uh, chapter nine. These in three full weeks of days is what the Hebrew actually says. In the English, you just say weeks because we obviously presume that that's days, but that's what it actually expressly says in the Hebrew. Now, these I want you to, I want you to get the picture here. Daniel is in a special fast. He's not necessarily in an absolute fast, as we'll see. There's all different kinds of fasts. And many extended fasts are ones in which you allow yourself maybe juices or some limited things. There are different kinds of fasts, but the main point is he is fasting for three full weeks. How many days is that? Twenty-one days. This I'm just we're going to draw an inference. This is not express in the in the chapter, but you can't help but want to, you want to note that he was fasting for three weeks. And he explains the fast in verse three. I ate no pleasant bread. Or bread of desires is what the Hebrew actually says. Neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. So you get the picture. This is one of these fasts that uh, is typically that some people uh, take of Lent or something like that. Set aside a certain time where you're going to give up certain things. And uh, uh, we're coming up to that kind of thing. Tomorrow night will be Rosh Hashanah in, in the Jewish calendar. And uh, you also re realize that uh, Rosh Hashanah is coincident with the Feast of Trumpets. They're actually different. Rosh Hashanah is a civil, first, civil year beginning, first of Tishri. But uh, the Feast of uh, uh, Trumpets is the religious celebration. And in the fifth century, they made it a two-day thing rather than just one day. But anyway, uh, that's all anticipatory, in a sense, of 10 days later will be Yom Kippur. And the time between the two includes a period called Days of Awe. And that's a time of national and individual renewal, a time when uh, observant Jews will t make a special effort to prepare themselves for Yom Kippur by reexamining their life, uh, trying to analyze what God would have them focus on, and uh, all in prep uh, preparation for the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the so most solemn of the days of their uh, calendar, and so on. So, in any case, Daniel is in a three-week fast, um, and, uh, and it says, In the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is the Hittichel. Now, Hittichel, we believe, is another title for t the Tigris. He's at the Tigris, not the Euphrates. Euphrates where Babylon was, he's, he's further east. And the main point here is an event that he remembers in terms of time. It's a tangible event. He says, then I lifted up mine eyes. There's that phrase again. We encounter that all through the Bible as a, a preamble of emphasis. Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, 
whose loins were girded with the fine gold of Uphaz. His body was like the barrel and his face as the appearance of lightning and his eyes as lamps of fire and his arms and feet like in color to polished brass and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And uh, so there's, this is obviously a very important angelic personage. Some scholars feel it may be Gabriel, but Gabriel appeared in the previous chapter. If it was Gabriel, I think Daniel would have said Gabriel. Other scholars suggest the possibility that this was a, an appearance of the pre-incarnate Christ. And many of these idioms that are describing him fit that idea. So I'm not, not here to disparage it. But there are other scholars, and I tend to side with them, that don't believe that this was a pre-incarnate Christ because it's going to turn out he needs Michael's help. And that we don't visualize Christ needing, you know, Michael's help. So there's a, there's a debate. And it turns out his actual identity is not critical. Just be aware of the fact there's different views by different scholars. And uh, I think the, the safe assumption here is that it is a, 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 an important person in the, in the, in the angelic structure but it's, we don't think it's Christ or Gabriel. It's just another one on an errand here, as we'll see. And uh, so as we'll see. But anyway, we're, this, the, the point is, Daniel is fasted for 21 days, and this messenger shows up with a very strange message. Verse 7, And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. So it's not quite clear here. Did they not see it because they had split? That's what it says, I guess. Or were there aspects of the vision that were for Daniel only? In either case, Daniel's alone. And so, fine. Therefore, I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me. For my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. The... Uh, Corruption here, it's, it's really, an, he lost any awareness of his holiness. In other words, he's, he feels very unholy, inadequate for the situation. That's basically what he's trying to uh, get there. Uh, it's interesting, uh, some scholars will speculate what on earth scared these people. Uh, it's very, in some respects, analogous to Saul on the Damascus Road and that sort of thing. But in the in this Damascus Road thing, the people with him heard, but they didn't, couldn't understand what was being said. And uh, uh, it was un they heard, but unintelligibly. Here, they actually just split, so Daniel's alone. And Daniel is really undone. And by the way, when he says this great vision, I believe that you'll, you'll, you'll infer that the vision he's talking about is not just chapter 10. Chapter 10 is an introduction to chapters 11 and 12. It's a huge thing forthcoming. Chapter 10 is going to focus on something else that we'll get to here in the next verse. Yet I heard the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. This word deep sleep, you previously had encountered two places. In uh, Genesis chapter 2, when Adam is put in a deep sleep, and Eve is taken out of his side. And the other deep sleep is when Abraham is put in a deep sleep, in Genesis 15. It's a phrase that occurs with some uh, frequency in the scripture. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. So he's off his hands and knees, he's now standing, but very, very apprehensive. And uh, before I go further, I'd like to comment on this frequent phrase about Daniel. We've encountered it before in the book, and that's that he's called the man greatly beloved. That's a distinctive. Uh, that um, It's interesting to me that, that Abraham was called a friend of God. It's one of his titles, and one of the, the, uh, the emblems of being a friend of God was God disclosed to him what he's about to do in Genesis uh, 18, what was coming in Genesis 19, and so forth. And, uh, and Jesus does the same thing to his disciples. In the upper room, John 14 and following, he said, you, up till now you've been my servants, for henceforth you are my friends. And then he goes on to give, I, I, I go and prepare a place for you, and he tells them what he's going to do. He, tell, he gives them a glimpse into the future. That's sort of the gift of a friend. 
When you have the concept of being beloved, that's far more than just a friend. Uh, to be beloved is more than just a friend. It's, a, it's you know, uh, a friend squared. It's a decimal points moved over. It's interesting that among the disciples, there's one singled out. That's beloved. And it fascinates me to notice the parallelism because Daniel is the beloved prophet and he gets this ap apocalyptic, apocalyptic vision of chapters 11 and 12. And John is the beloved disciple and he gets the book of Revelation. There's a linkage, I see, a pattern that's consistent between them. So I think that's interesting. But anyway, let's go, move on to verse 12. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Well, now wait a second. Daniel has been enduring this fast for 21 days. And it's when he started that this messenger was dispatched with a message to Daniel. What's he been doing for 21 days? He's going to explain. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and 20 days. The prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now your first reaction, well, gee, that's, you know, what's Darius or Cyrus or whoever doing there? No, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the power behind the kingdom of Persia, the supernatural prince. This is one of Satan's emissaries who is withstanding this. This prince of the king of Persia withstood me one in 20 days. In other words, he's trying to prevent this message getting, that's being dispatched, from getting to Daniel. But the prince of the king of Persia withstood me one in 20 days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now, here you, also, you know who Michael is. He's one of the archangels. There are three archangels we know about. Michael, Gabriel, and who else? Lucifer, who got himself in a lot of trouble. But he's using the term Michael, one of the chief princes. So the word prince here, you can, by, by context, get the impression what it's talking about are princes, rulers, leaders in that supernatural world. And it's the prince of the kingdom of Persia that's with, 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 restraining this ball carrier, if you will. And, uh, and he's apparently uh, resisted until he gets the heavy to join him. And they send in a tank here, <laughs> namely Michael. Now Michael, if you study his career in the scripture, both Michael and Gabriel you can learn a lot about by simply going to your Bible and looking at all the places they show up. You'll discover Gabriel in the Old and New Testament both, is always on an errand of announcement, a messianic announcer. He's bearing a message to Daniel chapter 9 and to Mary and Luke uh, 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 and so on. And so, Matthew 1, Luke 3, whatever. And uh, so, now Michael is a different kind of guy than, than uh, Gabriel. Michael is a warrior. In your mind's eye, you can visualize Michael wearing armor and with weapons because he always shows up fighting for Israel. He is, his apparent primary mission is to fight on matters that affect Israel. And that will show up in chapter 12 very dramatically. Anyway, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And I remained there with the kings of Persia. Then he says, now I am come to make thee understand and what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. So the focus of what we're going to be reading, in, not only in this chapter, but also the next two chapters, has to do with the people of Daniel. This is the nation Israel, before thy people in the latter days. And yet he points out it's distant, for the, 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 yet the vision is for many days. So, and when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground, and I became dumb. And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men, that's a strange phrase. And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. And then I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon me and I have retained no strength. So this is heavy stuff as far as Daniel is concerned. He says, For how can the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? For as for me, straightway there remained no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. You know, it's interesting to notice 
What always happens in the Bible in a major confrontation of this kind is an overwhelming sense of inadequacy of the beneficiary. That was true of Moses. That was true of Isaiah in chapter 6 when he has a, treated to a vision of the throne of God. Um, all the way through, if you, if you, as you read your Bible, you'll notice that whenever someone, whenever someone is, uh, uh, encounters uh, uh, a special messenger or whatever, uh, there is the, the reaction is one of heaviness of our own sin and inadequacy. One of the great failures of the Christian body as we generally see it today is a lack of the fear of God, a lack of awe. We sort of treat God as my buddy, you know. And indeed, there's an intimacy with Christ that... Uh, that uh, uh, we're, we, we enjoy, and yet somehow the emphasis on that has caused us to fail to really uh, recognize who we're dealing with, the ruler of the universe, and, and, and one who has standards, one who has requirements, one who has given us instructions that we've chosen to ignore. Not the stuff we don't know about, the stuff we do. <laughs> Mark Twain's classic remark. It's not the parts of the Bible I don't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do. <laughs> you know, it's typical Samuel Clemens. But anyway, so here is Daniel in the same situation. Straightway there remained no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. Then there came again and touched me, one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me. So there's apparently some people around here, see? He's the people in the sense of heavenly beings. I said, O oh man, greatly beloved, there it is again, fear not, peace be unto thee, and be strong, yea, be strong. Incidentally, that's a commandment. That's a commandment. Be strong. He's telling him something over which he has volition. We're going to encounter that later. We'll go to Ephesians 6 and talk more about that later in the study here. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. And uh, then said he, Knowest thou that wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Greece shall come. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael your prince. Wow. That's strange stuff. Now, he is, this, is, this closes this little chapter. From here we go to chapter 11 and more goes on, and, and we'll talk about that obviously next time. But I want, I want you to get the picture here. It's a very important picture. Daniel is fasting and praying for 21 days. At the end of 21 days, this person shows up, and he's going, and he explains his delay. I've been delayed for 21 days because I was withheld by the, this entity that he calls the Prince of Persia. And I was apparently stymied until Michael helps me. And apparently with Michael's help, he's been able to get through. So here he is with Daniel, and I'm about to give you some stuff. Call that 11 to 12, chapter 11 and 12. When I've done that, I have to go back and fight some more with the prince of Persia. That's what he's saying, see? I'll re I, and then now I'll return to, I've come under the, now I will return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, lo, the prince of Greece will come. Now, the Greek empire was 200 years later. But apparently behind the Greek empire, there is a super being of some kind, one of Satan's hosts. These are his senior officers. And one was in charge of Persia. Another one's in charge of Greece. And uh, this guy has to go back and finish the fight with Persia, and he knows that when that's over, he's going to have this guy, this other character, the Prince of Greece, is going to come. But before he leaves, he's going to say, I will, but I will show you that which is noted in the Scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael your prince. So this is very special. This guy and Michael are committed to informing and protecting God's people, the nation Israel. 
Michael is, in a sense, the prince that is he's the captain of the Lord's host with regard, military host with respect to, to Israel. So that is chapter 10. Now, this opens the whole discussion, first of all, of angels as a broad category. We use that term very broadly. And uh, angels are very powerful, obviously. But let's not lose sight of the fact that they are created beings. And uh, we need to understand who created them. Who created the angels? Jesus, Jesus Christ. You bet. There are some interesting books around in, on the subject called uh, Between Christ and Satan, intending to deal with spiritual warfare. Well, the book isn't bad, but the title's terrible. Because the title gives you the impression that there's an equivalence between Christ and Satan. No, no. Satan was a created being and created by Christ. Christ is the creator. And that, that's the misleading aspect of that, that famous title. But uh, the angels were around. They saw the world created. We find that in, uh, in uh, Job and elsewhere. And uh, so, they saw the, so they were created before the world was created. That doesn't make them timeless. It just makes them earlier in time. They have bodies. We find that in 1 Corinthians 15. And we find it in Luke 20. Angels have bodies. That makes them different than demons. Angels can materialize. I'm not suggesting that their bodies are limited to three dimensions. But they obviously have bodies. They can take people by the hand. They can engage in combat, for crying out loud. And uh, in fact, the word that's used for their body is a Greek word used called oikaterion. It occurs only twice in the Bible. In 2 Corinthians 5.2, where it refers to the body that you and I aspire to as our resurrection body. We look forward to getting off this temporary body we have and, and receiving that body, uh, the resurrection body. That, uh, and we know some things about that resurrection body. I didn't want to get, derail this whole study to get into all of that. Um, we've done some special briefing packages on that that uh, you can take, avail yourself if you want to read. Do, doing a serious study in this area is very fruitful. But there is a, 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 a verse you need to understand in 1 John 3, 2, where John says that uh, um, it does not yet appear, beloved, it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And in the English, you don't pick up on it all, but... Uh, to a physicist, that's a very, very, or a mathematician, that's a very key, key statement. What they're saying is we won't see a representation of him, like a photograph is a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional person. It's not that kind of thing. We shall see him as he is. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So whatever dimensionality he has, we'll enjoy too. And that's interesting, because you start studying the resurrection body of Christ, it's got some interesting capabilities. Okay, One of which, of course, is to materialize or not materialize, at will, which the angels also have. I'm not saying they're equivalent, but the angels also have that capability. And uh, we know from uh, Hebrews 13 and several other passages that people have entertained angels unawares. A lot did. You know, uh, two of these three guys, that came, well, the two guys that came down a lot to, get, to help a lot. The two of the three guys that visited Abraham, who had dinner with him. You all know in Genesis 18, Abraham served a meal to these three visitors, right? And if you have Jewish friends, ask them why he, he served a non-kosher meal. It was milk and calf together, right? I mean, kind of, you just give it to get them upset. It's kind of, um, I'm, just, I'm being fl flippant here. But in, in 19, uh, Lot receives these two guys, and they're his guests. And they have bodies. I can prove it to you. Because who was outside trying to get at them? The homosexuals. So, but, but also, uh, the, the New Testament tells us many of us have entertained angels unawares. They're able to, you know, uh, pass themselves off as people. There are guardian angels. You know, many of us think oh, that's just a pleasant little idiom for Sunday school kids. No, in Matthew 18, it speaks that children have a guardian angel. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that exciting? The... Uh, I know mine work overtime. Yeah. <laughs> and one angel, one night after dinner in 2 Kings 19, 
kills 185,000 Syrians. That's a lot of soldiers in any man's army, let alone in those days. And angels, interestingly enough, have a desire to learn. They're not like God who knows everything. They're not like God who are omniscient or omnipresent and all that sort of thing. No, they have limitations. But they desire to learn. That shows up several places in the Old Testament, but it's specifically alluded to by uh, in Peter's first letter. Angels have special assignments. They show up, usually in pairs, at every key juncture in the ministry of Christ. At his birth, of course. At the temptation he's ministered to by angels. And by the way, notice when you study the temptation, there's a very important fact there that impacts on our perceptions tonight. One of the three temptations was when Satan offered Christ all the nations of the world. He took Christ on a pinnacle and he said, he showed them all the nations of the world. And he, he made the claim, all these are mine, Satan speaking. All these are mine and I can give them to whoever I will. And I'll give them to you if you'll worship me. Now that is not a temptation unless he has ownership. Yeah, if I offered you the Brooklyn Bridge, you wouldn't be tempted because you have a serious doubt that I, have, uh, that I own it, right? If you don't, I got some property I would like to show you. you know? <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. But the point is, that claim is a temptation because of the validity of his assertion. These nations are mine, and I can give them to whoever I will. And, of course, what he's re-offering Christ is a path around the cross. Don't go to the cross. Go through all of that. Just worship me and it's over. You got it. All of it. It's all yours. I can give it to whomever will. The interesting point about that whole issue is that he, Christ did not dispute his ownership. And, uh, but anyway, Christ, after that whole episode, of course, he ministered. Mount Transfiguration, Matthew 17. Again, angels are present. At the resurrection, again, a pair are there at the resurrection. And at the ascension, ye men of Galilee, why do you stand looking in the heavens so forth? And, uh, and at his return, there'll be angels. So angels are very, very active agents, ministers, servants of the Almighty God. And they have many different ranks and styles and, and so forth. Now, there are several places in the scripture that are similar to the thing that we observed here where we have a, a supernatural entity referred to behind the person that's being addressed. Rhetorically, it's like a skewer. You're not looking at the, 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 the Prince of Persia. You're looking at the power behind him. Are you with me? That's really the target here. There are other skewering examples in the scripture, but the two most important ones are those of Satan himself. In Isaiah 14, Isaiah is addressing the king of Babylon. But as he does that, we begin to, by looking at what, he's, what is being said, you begin to realize that no way is limited to the king of Babylon, but rather what's in focus here is what's behind the king of Babylon, namely Satan. And, the, and there's a passage within Isaiah 14, there's a passage in there that clearly is recognized by scholars as alluding to Satan's ambitions. Another case is very similar to that that happens later in the book of Ezekiel. Now one's Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, it's easy to remember. The king of Tyre. The uh, Ezekiel's taking off against the king of Tyre, but then his language goes far beyond uh, literal king of Tyre, and it's clear that he's talking about the power that's behind him. Let's take a look at these so you get familiar with it. Now, Ezekiel 28, starting about verse 12. Son of man, that's an expression that all through the, is address, where God speaks of Ezekiel, son of man. Take up lamentation upon the king of Tyre, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. That's quite a statement. That's saying you are the epitome of wisdom. You are perfectly beautiful. Now, I've never seen pictures of the king of Tyre, but it's my conjecture from what follows. This is not talking about the king of Tyre. Anyway, because notice the, next very, the very next phrase. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. And he goes on. Wait a minute. The king of Tyre wasn't in Eden. Tyre didn't exist in those days. This passage, he's using the, 
the uh, address to Tyre to go through him, behind him, the power behind him, which is, and who is the power behind him? Let's take a look. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. These are classic ways to refer to different colors of light. The workmanship of thy tabrets and thy pipes, these are audio things, this is he's speaking to his musical ability, was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. So this creature that is here in focus was in Eden, clothed with light, he's the epitome of wisdom, he's the most beautiful thing, perfectly, perfectly beautiful, and he apparently is incredibly skilled at music. That's why people speculate that he may have led worship in heaven. Who knows? That's just that's a speculation from this contrived from this one phrase, I believe. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Interesting phrase. But get this is very important. Thou wast created. Satan is a created being. Don't lose sight of that. He does not have the attributes of God. To the extent you attribute those to him, he's a winning. He's winning. That's what, he, that's what he aspires to, as you'll see what Isaiah has to say about him. But Ezekiel finishes up, he says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. One of the creatures that we encounter in the Bible are cherubs. Not cherubs as the artists rendered them in the Renaissance, the little chubby infants with wings. That's, a, that's an artistic concept that has nothing to do with the Bible. A cherub is a singular. Cherubim is plural. These are the super angels. We only know of really four of them. One of them, well, I shouldn't say that, we know a couple others, but there's four around the throne of God that's vis very visible several places in the scripture, in Ezekiel 1 and 10 and in Isaiah 6 and elsewhere. Most people assume the seraphim and the, and the cherubim are, are functionally equivalent, maybe not, maybe there's different, that's neither here nor there. The, there was a cherub that was put in charge of guarding the way to the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. And most people visualize that because of their Sunday school coloring books, but that cherub was there to keep Adam and Eve from going back in the garden. Why? Because in the back of the garden, they would, have been, they would have been immortal in their sinful state. It would have denied them redemption. But there's another why. It, it didn't take a cherub to do that. A normal angel might have been enough. He's guarding the way to the tree of life. Who is he guarding it against? another cherub, this cherub. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. That's an old English expression, the way it's con contrived there. Anointed means he's appointed, uh, 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 given the mandate. To do what? To covereth. That he's in charge of everything. Apparently, Lucifer, or Satan as he's now called, was in charge of everything until he got on a pride trip. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou wast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy, de de in thy ways from the day that thou wast created until, there's one of these heavy, heavy untils, until iniquity was found in thee. And Isaiah is going to amplify where that, what that iniquity involved. He's the anointed cherub that covereth and uh, until sin was in his heart. And, uh, but the multitude of thy merchandise, they have, or traffic, merchandise and traffic, or sin, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. And thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. That's where the fire comes from. Not Dante. Don't get confused with English literature. The fire comes from, from inside him. Fire from the midst of thee, and it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Let's take a look at Isaiah, who has a similar passage. In Isaiah, he's talking to the king of, the king of uh, Babylon, not Tyre. How thou art fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations. 
For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And here's the capstone. I will be like the most high. He's going to be, he, wa he wants to set himself up as the equivalent of God himself. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. The famous five I wills of Satan. Pride, ambition. That was the source of That's why God hates pride. Because that's what led to all the rest. Then here's his, here's his destiny. Yet thou shalt be brought down to Hades. Or actually, yeah, excuse me, the Sheol. It's in the Old Testament. Thou shalt be brought down to Sheol to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the one that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? Now, there's a lot of theology there. You can spend a lot of time studying. We're not going to go that far, because, but I'll give you a perspective here. Satan wanted to be numero uno. He was the epitome of things. He was in Eden. His five I wills and pride brought him down. And his angels were also cast out with him. We know from Revelation a third of them. A third of the angels were his, his in control. And uh, they are um, subject to all kinds of comments throughout the scripture. Don't confuse them with the demons. Angels can materialize. Demons can't. What about demons? They're distinct from angels. Demons desperately seek embodiment. You don't talk about angels trying to indwell a person. Satan does. That's a spe special situation. But demons apparently are distinct from angels. They seek embodiment. They know their destiny. At Gadara in Matthew 8, that uh, have you come to torment us before the time? See, they apparently know what their destiny is. They also recognized Jesus as the Son of God before he announced it publicly. You go through the New Testament, you can put together quite a little notebook on discoveries about angels. Make a notebook in two different tabs, angels, demons. And put together everything you can find out about both of them. And I think you're going to discover they seem to be very different. In the Old Testament, there's all kinds of verses, and these will be in your notes, uh, New Testament also. But uh, anyway, consider this then. Daniel was fasting for 21 days, right? It took tw this guy 21 days to get through. This is just a discussion question for your small group when you're kicking the stuff around. But suppose Daniel had stopped his fast after only 20 days. Is there a linkage between his fast and this spiritual warfare this guy is fighting to get through to Daniel? We jump to the conclusion, it's an inference on our part, that there's some kind of linkage here. Is one of the reasons that we don't have the, some of the revelations and insights that some of the old timers had because we don't fast and pray seriously? I won't ask for a show of hands, but uh, do we take, undertake serious fasts? Now be careful, don't take a serious fast without some background. There's some good books about it in any good Christian bookstore. But you want to do a little homework before going on an extended fast. And, you don't have, and Daniel wasn't on an absolute fast. He just gave up certain luxuries as his gesture of, of being serious about seeking God. And, uh, but he did it for 21 days, and that's what it apparently took to get this guy through. Well, he had the prince of the power of Persia. Is there a prince of the power of the United States? Is behind the scenes, are the things going on in which our current policies and our current controversies and whatever are simply a vestige of or result of behind-the-scenes spiritual warfare? That's a possibility. That's a possibility. Is there a prince of the power of the United Nations? Unquestionably. You knew that back in 1945 when they opened with, in paganism rather than a prayer, Christian prayer. United Nations is vigorously, aggressively promoting the pagan, pagan ideas. Very anti-Semitic and very pro-New uh, Agey kinds of things. Is there a prince of the power of the European Union? You bet. 
And we infer if the, if the European grows to be pro forma equivalent to the Roman Empire, which means an eastern leg, then uh, that starts to have all kinds of overtones with respect to the super leader that's coming down the pike that's going to be known as the Assyrian. So there's all kinds of aspects to this to get into. But what's really the ultimate issue here? This is a little short chapter. It's just a prelude to the next two chapters, which we'll be spending plenty of time on. But the main issues here are you and I, first of all, let's just recap what we think we know. We are in possession of a message of extra, extra, extraterrestrial origin. You've heard me beat this so often, it's become a trademark. 66 books penned by over 40 guys over, over virtually 2,000 years that are an integrated message. It's from the outside, outside of our time space, our space-time continuum. Paul even lists the four dimensions that we experience directly in Ephesians 3.18. Four dimensions, not three. And uh, yet we know that there are six others. Particle physics tells us that. And the ancient sage Nachmanides in his commentary on Genesis published that in the 12th century. There are at least ten dimensions. The, the, the scientific papers are full of conjectures about the string theory in uh, 10 or 11. There are, the math, there's some mathematical implications by all of this. Uh, the net of it is, is that there are six dimensions that we, we know are there, but we can't experience directly. Should we be surprised that the Bible talks about a spiritual world that is the superset of the world we experience? We are in a subset. We're in a digital simulation. The particle physicists tell us that you can't divide things below a certain minimum quanta, or they, lo they lose locality. Boy, what does that mean? And uh, we find ourselves bounded in a finite universe and a finite uh, boundary of reality on the small side. The microcosm and the macrocosm, both limited digitally. We're in a simulation. And we discover that this simulation, outside this simulation that we experience, there's a war going on. And it portrays us as objects of this unseen warfare. The Bible talks about that from cover to cover. Here in Daniel 10, we get a very strange nationalistic type glimpse of this. Our eternal destiny depends upon our relationship with the winner of this cosmic conflict. We need to have a relationship with the winner, and now's the time. See, we're both, we are both participants, and we're also the prize. We're in a very peculiar situation. It's almost analogous, if you play chess, to the pawn. It's the only piece of the player in chess that gets a promotion. Just a soldier, cannot retreat, goes forward step by step. And if he endures to the end, he gets made into the most powerful piece on the board. Very similar. Our eternal destiny depends on this. And the real question is, what is your readiness for this encounter? Daniel encountered this friendly messenger and was undone. Had to be you know, uh, uh, separately strengthened to endure even the presentation. What's your readiness for the encounter? There is a passage that I want you to undertake a personal study of. We're not going to go through it all here. I want to just give you the highlights so you know where to go. But Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 10. And most books on this subject stop a verse too soon. I'll come to that. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. That's a command. The same command Daniel had. Be strong. You say, well, how do, I, how do I do that? Well, that's what this is all about. How do you become strong? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, not yours, or you're going to be bankrupt. Then he says, put on the whole armor of God. He's going to say that twice for emphasis. Put on the whole armor, not your favorite pieces, the whole armor. Why? That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You're up against some pretty powerful adversaries. You don't stand a chance on your own. Put on the whole armor of God. To do that, you've got to know what the, what the elements are. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take, you, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the, uh, withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Here again, it's the second time he says, put on the whole armor of God. And then he, then he goes on to list the elements. 
Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And that's where, verse 17 is where many of these little, some of the classic studies of this passage stop. By the way, that's six elements. You'd think they'd look for a seventh just to round it out, wouldn't you? What is the seventh one? Verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication of all the saints and so on. Prayer, that's your heavy artillery. Let's look at this again. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and pressure. Put on the whole armor of God. He says that twice. And as this verse 12 is so often quoted by people, when it says spiritual wickedness in high places, you think that's talking about maybe the office of the president or something. The word high there is actually heavenly places. High in a, in a spiritual sense. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. The word is archai, which is, is, uh, is uh, the highest. The, these things are in descending order. That's the highest. And I think the principalities, were, this, this is, the, this is the, the command structure, if you will, and powers, exousia, and, uh, or authorities is another way of putting it. And uh, the rulers of darkness of this world, a cosmic order, it's a, it's a, a ruler of, of, of uh, powers in the heavenly places. And spiritual wickedness in the heavenly, it says high, but heavenly places. These levels are levels of angels. These are adverse angels. These are angels against you. In the Greek, it's, it, it, it's, probably, there would, it, it's not in our normal vocabulary, so I don't know how you could improve on it really in the English. But the point is, these things are not flesh and blood. So this isn't uh, presidents or congressmen or senators or uh, heads of media organizations or bankrupt executives in Hollywood or whatever, no. These are, uh, those are vestiges of a power behind the scenes. These are, these are angels of the dark side that we're dealing with. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against these characters. Are you ready for that? By the way, you're already on enemy territory. It says, wherefore take on you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and then I'll stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. That's where you start. How do you know something's true? Jesus said, be not deceived. How do you prevent yourself from being deceived? There are ways to do that. Find out what they are. We'll be trying to produce some particular materials on the, in the field of practical epistemology, study of knowledge its scope and limits. How do you find out something's true? I love my wife's definition of truth. She uncovered a great one. Truth is when the word and the deed become one. And... Uh, so there's a practical side of this without getting into the theological labyrinth of, of, uh, of massaging definitions. And having the breastplate of righteousness. Whose righteousness? Not yours. Somebody else's. Find out what that's all about. And then your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You can't go there unprepared. You need to have Preparation. Above all, above all, taking the shield of faith. Shield of faith. The Roman soldiers used to repair their shields between battles. There was a hole in it. They fixed it before the next battle. You don't do that during the battle. Is your faith got a hole in it? Is there something in your faith profile that bothers you that isn't? Fix it. Do some homework. Plug that hole. Understand where you stand. Now's the time to do it, not later. But while taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. If there's a hole in your faith, then Satan knows where it is and he'll, find a, he'll, he'll shoot something through there. And take the helmet of salvation. What on earth is that all about? Owning it's not enough. You've got to wear it. You can tell who's not wearing their helmets by the bandages, right? And the sword of the spirit. Now, we all know what the sword of the spirit is. Word of God. Many people visualize Paul writing this while he's chained to a centurion. And they figure that he's, looking, he's, taking, he's using this as a rhetorical analogy. No, he's actually drawing all of these from the Old Testament, by the way. So it's deeper than that. Well, then why is the centurion chained to him? So the centurion can't get away. You know. <laughs> Can you imagine being chained to Paul for a full shift? And we know many of them, many of the Praetorians came to faith because of that. The household of Caesar, that's a phrase of the Praetorians, not some, anyway. 
The sword of the spirit. You know, many people don't understand the Roman strategy. The Romans, the, the, the technology, the classical technology of swords were long curved swords. A long served cord, a sword gives you an advantage of reach. At the Naval Academy, you have, you have uh, uh, four years of, well, you have three years of, of uh, boxing and wrestling, and the last year's hand, that's combined into hand to hand. But, but uh, I used to hate boxing. I just don't like boxing. Some people do, it's their sport. I just didn't like it. But fortunately, I've got a long reach. And so I kept, could keep myself out of serious trouble because of the reach. And, uh, but the sword, the Romans did something different. They invented the machaira, 24 inches, double edged. And with that, they conquered the world. But there's two things about a machaira that you need to know. If you had one, you wouldn't win with it. There was a particular technique that went along with it. You had to be trained, and you had to practice, 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 practice. And if you did that, you won. And they did. They conquered the world virtually. This is your sword. Have you been trained in its use? Do you have an outline you can follow with an unbeliever to, 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 in certain situations? Do, do you know where to look for whatever? When somebody challenges, do you know where to go to find a rebuttal to that? It takes a little training. Not a lot the fun, for the fundamentals. No. Can you lead a, a, a Jewish person to Jesus Christ using only the Old Testament? Not hard to do. And it's always been effective. It was done, it was done uh, seven different times in the book of Acts by... 12 different times in the book of Acts by seven different people. And, uh, and we don't do it today. Most, people don't know, most Christians don't even know their Old Testament. And it takes practice, training and practice. That's what a sword's all about. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, here's the last one. I'm always intrigued by this because there's some classic studies of this passage that overlook the heavy artillery. Praying, that's your action at a distance. When you're in the field, you can call in the heavy armor. From by, you can call it a headquarters. Hey, send me some air cover. Send me wh whatever. It's your heavy artillery. Praying always with prayer and supplication in the spirit. Watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and so forth. Girded with truth. Breastplate of righteousness. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Shield of faith. Helmet of salvation. Sword of the spirit. And prayer. I'm going to encourage you to take each one of these, track them down, find out what is really meant. Because your command is to put on the whole armor. To put on the whole armor, you have to know what the elements are, what they consist of, and how to use them, where they belong, and how they function. Check it out. It's crucial. And by the way, if you're really serious about a devotional life, there's a treasure I'll acquaint you with. It's in three volumes by William Gurnall. It's a Puritan classic, first published in 1655, 1658 and 1660, was revised in 1864, and then there's an abridged for it. It's in three volumes anyway, even the abridgment. Um, and it's available in most serious Christian bookstores. You can get it by uh, Christian resources. But it's a three-volume set that goes through this devotionally, thoroughly, very, very, very uh, terrific. Uh, um, Spurgeon and others... Uh, relished in this as one of their uh, as a cherished part of their. There's some of them said if they had to have if they were isolated where they had only one other book beside the Bible, this is what they'd want with them. But let's just stand back. You know, we are here right in the middle of a timeline called now. Behind us is memories of the past. Ahead of us is the hopes of the future. Where is your connection with eternity, where all this stuff is going on? We tend to think of eternity as in the future. Well, all this stuff is going to happen later. No. Now is your connection with eternity. The past is but a memory. The future is but a hope. Now. You are either saved or not saved now. Your situation before the throne of God is now. So understand that. Take that to prayer and get serious about it. It's time to take our faith seriously. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. By the way, you can have a missionary assignment in the Sudan. There are millions of Christians being killed by Muslims. They're called by their names in the media, but that's what's going on. And you can participate in that mission. And you can do it without leaving your bedroom. You pray for them. You can pray for the persecuted church. 
most of the body of Christ in most of the world for most of the last 1900 years is under persecution. You can participate in that with prayer. You also pray for this country because we are in a critical watershed in this country. Um, our problems did not end with the previous administration. Even the current administration, even if it gets renewed, has got some challenges in front of it that we need to pray about, that they be informed properly, that they have the resolve to see things through. We are facing a very, very different America over the coming decade than we've had in the previous few decades. We need to, if you care for your children and grandchildren, you want to spend a lot of serious time in prayer. Let's bow our hearts right now. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for this glimpse that you've given us regarding the wars that are going on, unseen, around us. And Father, we would pray that you would open our hearts and lives to your word and help us to understand what it is that makes up our essential armor. Help us, Father, to understand what each one of these elements are. Help us, Father, to be effective at responding to your word. Help us, Father, to be obedient to your command to be strong and your command to put on the whole armor of God. Help us, Father, to be diligent, to be serious, to contend for the faith. We thank you, Father, for your word and your Holy Spirit. We do pray, Father, that you would just reignite in each of us a hunger for your word. Help us, Father, to be more fruitful stewards of the opportunities that are before us. Help us, Father, to be sensitive to our brothers and sisters in need. And help us, Father, to be more effective and more pleasing in your sight. Not by power nor by might, but by your spirit, Father. For we solicit that in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua, Jesus Christ.